primo ospite, Now, I'd like to invite the first guest who is established from home, of course. I'm very glad to welcome Paolo Zanzotti. Hello, Paolo. 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 Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Dai. Well, in casa. At home. In casa, eh? Ricordiamo che tu sei collegato da? We... Brescia. Repeat once again, you're from Bene, Brescia, che è una zona you're establishing a connection from Brescia, and we know that that city importante. was uh, struck by the infection in a very strong way, so thank you very much. You've been uh, doing a very good work, and data, of course, are very important. I've been working on the situation, we know that it's very difficult to read out data, 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 And anche delle, delle altre people that work with you, of course, will also say something, but I'd like to give you the floor. Se Grazie, Cosmano. So Condividi il tuo schermo. So if you share palco. your screen for the presentation, please. Eccoci. Okay. Ci siamo quasi, Paolo. Paolo, we're almost there. Ditemi quando ci siamo. Dovremmo Tell quasi esserci. Ready. Almost naturalmente ready. un po' di latenza ma un po' di delay secondo me ci siamo ecco qua Paolo okay. io lascio a te la parola Paolo, grazie mille ottimo grazie Cosmano uh, breve premessa dopo essere molto uh, veloce ho cercato di riassumere in pochissimo tempo un po' di materiale che ho creato in questi giorni la volontà è stata quella di cercare di uh, far capire a tutti banalmente come interpretare i dati che ogni giorno ci arrivano uh, dalla protezione civile innanzitutto ma anche poi filtrati dal mondo dei mass media uh, perciò come possiamo leggere i dati e quando leggiamo i dati appunto la, la, la condicio sine qua non è quella di partire sempre da fonti dei dati attendibili uh, queste sono quelle che che ritengo maggiormente attendibile, ho segnalato John Hopkins, che è stata una dei primi a seguire l'evento, e in Italia la protezione civile di SS, uh, Come acquisiamo il dato in, nelle statistiche perciò del coronavirus? Ci sono i primi sintomi, a quel punto si arriva a fare un tampone, eh, nel caso in cui il tampone sia positivo, puoi andare o in quarantena domestica o venire ospedalizzato, quindi guarire, se peggiori va in terapia intensiva, anche di poi guarire oppure può esserci un decesso. Questo è il percorso che dobbiamo tenere presente anche in termini di acquisizione del dato. Quindi abbiamo come metriche di base i contagi totali, i casi attivi, che sono quelli appunto ancora infettati in quarantena domestica, ospedalizzati in terapia intensiva, che poi si trasformano in casi chiusi, che sono i guariti e purtroppo i decessi. Queste sono le nostre metriche di base da tenere sempre presente. Eh, il problema è che a volte quando eh, ce le dicono velocemente non riusciamo a capire di cosa stanno parlando. Eh, il percorso statistico quindi eh, della malattia si divide in casi attivi in un primo momento che poi si trasformano in casi chiusi. Quando analizziamo i dati di un contagio, di un'epidemia, dobbiamo avere presente il, quello che io ho chiamato il concetto dell'onda. Tutte le epidemie formano a livello grafico un'onda, questa è la, la spagnola in Russia nel 1918, Zika, l'Università del Rosario, ok, nel fine 2015, inizio 2016, Ebola, 2014-2015 e questa è il Covid-19 in, in Corea. Come si può vedere nel, quando analizziamo l'onda di quello che ho chiamato dei contagi giornalieri, i nuovi casi giornalieri, che non è il dato che ci dà purtroppo la protezione civile che ci dà i nuovi attivi giornalieri, è leggermente diverso. Comunque la metrica di base è che è quanti nuovi tamponi positivi che avevamo avuto ogni giorno, abbiamo una prima fase in cui l'epidemia si espande, il famoso R R con zero maggiore di 1, una fase in cui si raggiunge il picco dell'epidemia, il famoso plateau R con zero uguale circa intorno all'1 e una fase di diminuzione dell'epidemia. Questa è una curva classica. L'altro grafico che possiamo vedere è portato è quella invece dei contagi totali, questa è una curva, una curva invece cumulata, questo è il caso della Cina dove chiaramente non potrà mai essere azzerata, ma l'obiettivo di contenere un'epidemia è quello di portare diciamo, alla sintotto del, del limite nel massimo questo tipo di curva. Eh, questa è la curva dei, con, dei contagi totali per sotto la Corea del Sud. Eh, questa è quella dei giornalieri, come vedete queste due curve rappresentano lo stesso fenomeno, stessa 
escala temporale e stesso same fenomeno, the same timeline, the same phenomenon, Covid and this is accumulated, uh, sono, scale and this is a daily scale. You can see the same phenomenon in two different ampia, ways. Here diciamo, you've got a wider perspective, uh, it's almost a summary of what has been going on and this is a more real-time approach, it's a zoom in in the uh, in previous in Italia, uh, graphic, basically. But where we're at uh, now in Italy, Italy. this uh, is yesterday's data, the total infection wave, which is the one that should uh, uh, proceed into a uh, plateau, which is, asymptom, however, not there yet. And this is a day of infections after an expansion phase. We have this sort of plateauing after yesterday, the day before yesterday. We are starting il basso. La curva è uh, importante da seguire in questo momento che siamo ormai in una fase avanzata di epidemia, perciò uh, la curva che dobbiamo controllare maggiormente so per capire uh, quale sia lo stress in sanitario a cui è sottoposto in order to il nostro the sistema e per capire anche quali e come ci siano le possibilità di riapertura per settori, per fattività e quant'altro, è questa, perché la curva dell'andamento dei casi attivi è la persona che sono positive, che è calcolato come il Cases. And this is calculated as the total amount of cases minus the death minus the healed cases. So this is what we have to keep under control. And this curve is about to reach a peak. We haven't reached a peak yet. How to interpret data? Three vital things to understand. The first thing is time deviation. Because when a person gets tested and, is, and turns positive, it's included in today's positive cases. But of course, they have been affected by COVID-19 or any other um, illnesses before. So you've got a day, uh, a, day, a day for the first symptoms that is calculated, the date of onset. And this is calculated based on an interview and on the test. And so this date is called date of onset, as was said. And this is the Chinese curve, the Chinese diagram. This is very important. Uh, Thomas Wei has written very, Wei has written a very interesting article on this. The yellow line are the positive infections. So the data we receive on a daily basis, the blue line are the onset date. So today's um, date or people that are asked today, when do you have the first symptoms and you then have this line? This is very interesting because when China started the lockdown, as you can see, the infection was blocked straight away. But in the yellow curve, as you can say, there are still some positive tests. So basically, these are the people who were affected by the disease previously. So when you see uh, the beginning of a downward trend, uh, you can see a distance of 15 days, for instance, for China. Or this, for instance, is uh, March the 23rd. And in Italy, we had the lockdown on March 11th. And you can notice how after 11 days, 11 days later, we are witnessing the first signs of a downward trend for the daily infections. This data was confirmed by the ISS. So this is a very recent data, very recent information. And the ISS is showing the un outside data. And as you can see there from here, on March the 11th, when we locked down, you have the light blue data, which is still increasing and uh, scaring us. But as a matter of fact, when everything was locked down, the infections slowed down and the number was reduced. And this is the reason why we are staying at home right now. So after 10 days, we have a 10 days delay for the calculation. Sometimes uh, you can really tell by interpreting the data. Second, the test deviation, because data are disturbed by the number of tests performed. The more tests you do, the more cases you find. The blue line is the test line and the gray line is the infection line. There's a, a strong link, of course, a, a strong uh, relationship, of course, but uh, this is normal. So you have more people in statistics, basically. So if we keep this data under control, we can see the positive tests with relation to the total tests. This is also very important data to take into account. The number of tests looks um, like it is diminishing the uh, death rate. 
And of course, we also have to take into account the population of a country, which is very important data, and the relationship between the death rate and the relation. And, but Italy is one of the countries that made the most tests in the world and also the way uh, you do the tests changes things and then of course the death deviation let's look at the path of the illness again so here now the only positive tests are kind of statistics so all of the death you can see the, the are people that underwent a test and were positive and either died because of COVID only or because of COVID and other previous symptoms and uh, diseases or problems. When our healthcare system was uh, stressed at the beginning, from the first symptoms to the test and hospital uh, hospitalization, there were four days and five days between these two last steps, so intensive therapy and death. And this is, uh, as you can find, individual epidemiologic reports of March 20, 2020. And the sad thing about our healthcare system is that our system is a bit collapsed, and therefore intensive therapy is not working in an efficient way. And there is a direct step uh, between hospitalization and death, so to leading to death directly. This is due to the collapse of the healthcare system, and this is also in the EISS data and in the report as you can see there are five days for um, intensive treatment and five days also for the ones that did not undergo intensive uh, treatment and therefore uh, March 20 for instance there was no treatment for these people but they went the second path when we look at the daily infection graphic and the death graphics, we don't have to uh, overlap them on the same scale. We have to divide the scale into different axes because, of course, these are coming later. So there was a first stress for the healthcare system and a first death increase on uh, the first days of March. As you can see 6, 7 March. And the second stress around 8 March with an increase in the number of deaths and then a collapse of the system with a strong increase of death cases. And we've reached uh, an infection peak now, so and thank to God, this, uh, so uh, thank God, this is also renting the infection rate and the death rate. This is Spain, for instance, on March 25th, and so uh, this is what happened pretty much everywhere else. USA, there were just a few death cases now over uh, 1,000. The UK. Uh, it was also a very critical time. France, also in France, was a critical situation. There is a stress in the healthcare system, an overload. And of course, there's an increase in the death rate because efficiency is less. And this path is interrupted. And you can have this phenomenon. The hospital system is also collapsing. There are less uh, places, less treatments, people are not hospitalized, they are hospitalized later, uh, too late sometimes to save them, and some, at some point there is a collapse of the healthcare system. Also the ER and the hospitals are really blocked and stuck. Ambulance is waiting outside of the ER with people um, connected to oxygenation systems because the hospital was saturated in the ER as well. So sometimes you can't even have tests for people. In that case, you have death cases that are not counted, like in the last few days. Uh, for sure, we will never be able to count them, but for sure, you also have those cases. Then COVID-19 and um, the predictive models. We have to try to forecast the future, but more the, not with a crystal ball, but with maths. This is something that we can do, and this is very crucial. You can do it with a, an epidemiological mathematical model. How does an epidemiological mathematical model 
uh, starts. You, of course, first of all, you have an empiric um, reporting activity and statistic witnessing on the phenomenon, and you've got uh, two or three months' time observation. Then you've got a basic function, like a linear function, trying to describe and to follow this empirical curve. And then you can model and shape this function with mathematical processes, like the Poisson regression, for instance, and you obtain a curve that more or less follows a model. But first and foremost, you get a function which describes the observed phenomenon over time. Obtaining such a function makes it possible for you to observe what's going on, what's w what will happen in the future, because this gives you a time scale where you can project um, future perspective. And this is vital because it makes it possible for you to know what will happen. It's a sort of time machine created with a mathematical function, a real time machine, which has to be very precise, of course. How do you assess the accuracy of a mathematical model? You've got a function here that is uh, represented on a time scale. And as soon as the phenomena are happening, you start measuring them and you understand whether the function is more or less precise if compared to the empirical data that you get uh, day by day a measure over time. This is a less accurate function, for instance, and it's not following a mathematical model. And this is a model with an accurate mathematical function. So it can forecast with a um, certain accuracy level uh, and can assess what will happen in the future. The classical model to study epidemics is the SEER model. So it's based on a susceptible population, which is a blue line an eligible population, then you've got infection in red, and black for the death cases. So the virus basically rushes over the population and makes and, and works on the population. Applying the serum model on COVID was possible, and these two people, these two mathematicians did that. Professor Luigi Bugnano, a professor of uh, and numeric analysis in the University of Florence, and Felice Yavanaro, associate professor in the Bari University, two very great mathematicians in Italy, and they applied the SIR model to COVID-19 in Italy. This was the application of the SIR model. As you can see, you've got the dots for the empirical data, so protezione civile data, civil uh, protection data, and the blue curve, the function. Uh, at the beginning, the model was working very good and was very accurate, but um, at a certain point, it was a bit wrong, as you can see, especially here. The SIR model cannot be fully applied to COVID-19 because it's a new virus, because it has different um, outbreak waves, also on a territorial basis. And the two professors modified the SIR model and came up with MR-SIR by Brugnano and Lavernaro model, and they applied it by dividing Italy into different areas, so northern Italy, central and southern and, uh, Italy and Isles. This is what we had uh, the previous days, and this is yesterday's diagram with the active cases. You can see, so in three days' time, we should reach the peak of active cases and finally have a downturn trend. Ha see how precise this model is, especially in the curves and in uh, central and southern parts of Italy where you have more fear, basically. So this model is extremely precise and this is great, I think, because a mathematical model is a time machine and can give you past and future scenarios. The time machine that was invented by these two mathematicians should give an answer to the questions what, have, what would have happened if and what would happen if. <coughs> and this is vital in a pandemic and in coexistence during a pandemic and in case new pandemic wa waves will come. What would have happened if we had no lockdown? This was also calculated without the lockdown, red line, with lockdown, mathematical model, and you look at the data, how precise they are. Without the lockdown, we would have doubled the number of active cases, so 170,000 instead of 90,000. And we've, calculate, we've been calculating in a very conservative way because we basically projected the 
healthcare uh, model of the Lombardy region all over the other regions, so we weren't that conservative. How many deaths would we have had without lockdown? Without the lockdown in Italy today, we would have had 60,000 and more deaths without lockdown. So basically, with the lockdown, we saved all of these lives, 40,000 people. Basically, this is a sacrifice we're doing in order to save those lives, especially their lives. And this is something we owe to Luigi and Felice. So people like them can really help in these difficult situations. And they can help right now. They can help our country to take to make the right decisions because we will understand the impact of this epidemic. Luigi and Felicia, can you please help me? Okay, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, Paolo, can you hear me? Okay, thank you so much for your explanation, for describing data. Uh, before giving the floor to Luigi and Felice, let me add a comment. First of all, you have been talking about the sacrifice, and what we are doing now is helping us, saving 40,000 people. Um, so also for all the people watching us from home, well, um, I know that some countries are adopting measures right now, but when you talk to entrepreneurs or business people, I mean, if we think back in March, 23rd of March, well, we couldn't understand it properly. We thought we could have a normal life and we did not understood um, data. So thank you for explaining data. Thank you for explaining it. Um, you know, Luigi and Felice knew that this model that I have explained let us foresee what is going to happen in 30 days. And this is paramount, so this is critical. I mean, it's like a sailing without any equipment. Um, this is an important instrument we have. Uh, so Luigi and uh, Felice, they are connected with us. So let's start from Luigi, a mathematician from University of Florence. Good afternoon, Luigi. Uh, actually, sorry, we have Felice first. Thank you for, for inviting me. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you for the work you are carrying out. Uh, would you like to add something or to tell us something more about what you are doing as mathematicians? Um, nobody knows what you are doing, but actually this is so useful. Um, would you like to give us your point of view? And of course, we thank you for the work you, you are doing. Uh, well, I would like to thank you for involving us during this outstanding event. Well, actually, this project was started as a game, I would say, because the first data were uh, published following the same criteria. Uh, but uh, looking at data, um, it was quite clear that uh, we needed formulas and equations. At first, uh, we used static ones, but then in the very last chart, you can see that uh, the equations were the result of the evolutionary models. So basically, you can see that you start from parameters, and all the parameters were used to best fit data. So once you have adapted the parameters to uh, data, then you can see that uh, the model and its solutions can help us 
uh, foresee the future, foresee the situation in the days to, to come, in particular in the future and in the uh, short term, but also in the long term. And all this made it possible, for example, to set a first goal, which was to identify the peak day. So the day uh, starting from which we would have seen the curve to flatten and to decline, which means a decline in daily new cases. Um, because if the number of new cases decreases, well, at the same time, the risk of catching the virus decreases as well. From this point of view, I can tell you that, well, as you know, we don't have vaccines or no specific treatment for the virus. So the only weapon we have, also from a mathematical point of view, is social distancing because social distancing decreases the risk of catching the virus. And uh, um, since we don't have drugs, uh, this is the only weapon, this is the only solution we have in order also to improve the uh, situation in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Felice. Um, is Luigi connected? We just wait for Luigi. Luigi, if you can switch on the mic and we wait for you. But in the meantime, um, Paolo, you, you said that you already knew all that and um, you, you have data. Okay, so Luigi is connected now. Can you, can you hear us? Okay, we can uh, hear you and we can see you as well. Okay. You are in Florence, right? Yes, I teach at the University of Florence a mathematical faculty. And as Felice was saying, well, we started it um, like playing with data. We wanted to understand the evolution of the pandemic. And uh, we relied on established uh, tools to, 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 to look at the future. And at a certain point, uh, we realized that what we had was not reliable. So we developed a new model, which is actually the model we are using uh, currently. So this means that by adapting the modeling, we can also understand what is going on and how this system works. We do approximations, of course, we are quite satisfied uh, for the time being, but of course we have to fine tune and uh, to improve our motor. Can we see Paul as well? Thank, thank you for introducing them and I thank you for um, talking about scientific research because for many years I have to say that uh, the uh, research studies were not uh, considered enough so I think this is an important message um, I mean we um, watch the news and very often we get the wrong ones or uh, people um, sometimes believe that uh, the central government decisions are something they would 
They don't like to follow, but we are happy that we had the chance to talk about data and uh, to start uh, from evidence. And of course, uh, we will wait for the uh, daily uh, data at 6 p.m. today uh, from the uh, civil protection. I also would like to convey this message um, Felice and Luigi did all that as volunteers with the instruments uh, we had. We had no opportunity to to actually exchange with other experts, and uh, as I have already said, we are actually trying to raise funds because we would like to improve our computing um, tools and uh, we would like to set up a group, a work group, in order to improve and increase the computing power and in order to support the decision makers with evidence. We really want to help the decision makers, but uh, to, to do so, well, this is quite a wide project and we know that the community is supporting us. Yes, of course, our community is supporting you. We will help you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for um, accepting our invitation and of course we will be waiting to hear data at 6 p.m.